presentation and continues this contact tracing process. Dr. Nipple. Hey, Patrice Sulek. Welcome, Patrice Sulek, our Director of Health in the North Central District Health Department. Really nice to be in person. Yes. <laughs> but socially distanced in part. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Carl. And um, I'd just like to say before I turn it over to uh, Brian, um, is I don't think any of us, uh, when, you, when you get into education, you get into running a school district or working for a school district. Um, it's certainly less there are our fine nurses who are here that work in, in, in the health field. Thank you all for, for being here. Uh, you don't really think you're going to be learning about, um, you know, how viruses, uh, you know, spread in a community and how you contact trace and, and you know, like diving deep into um, health mitigation strategies. I know it's not something that I had ever uh, thought about. And just to give you an idea, um, you know, Brian Greenleaf, uh, basically, he didn't know anything about this either, but guess what he can do? He reads and he learns and then he can apply what he learns to the betterment of the school district. And he's done a, an amazing job working with um, all of the support staff, the nurses and other people throughout the district uh, to really set up uh, some really great parameters and uh, contact tracing and things to kind of keep our schools open, um, but also ensure the safety of and health of, our, of all of our um, staff and students. And of course, uh, we're, we're also very uh, pleased to have uh, Patrice Sulik from the North Central Department Health District, who has been a partner with us. Uh, and she's just, I don't think she signed up for working 24 seven uh, for the past since March. So she has been around the clock working with all of the local school districts in the area. Uh, very supportive, very knowledgeable. We have a great working relationship. Um, and we're, we're, very, we're very pleased that she's gonna be here tonight to be able to answer some, uh, some extra questions that you may have based on um, Brian Greenleaf's uh, presentation. So with that said, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Brian and we can go from there. Yeah, we're just gonna pull up, uh, give us a second here, we're gonna pull up the presentation. Uh, you also have one in your packet. Uh, it's got a big Elementary Public Schools logo on the front. <coughs> Working perfect. All right, so you know we, we talked a lot about the mitigation strategies that have been in place, right? So we were talking about these uh, plexiglass barriers uh, that we're all sitting next to. We've talked about social distancing, which we're all you know practicing here. We've talked about wearing the masks. Um, one thing we haven't really talked about as a group in, in great detail um, is the risk assessment and contact tracing, basically preparing for uh, if somebody gets sick. And if you recall back to you know the, the plan that we presented uh, to you and it was approved in July, one of the main components, I got yep. Um, one of the main components of our mitigation strategies is preparing for when somebody gets sick. Um, and so risk assessment and contact tracing are, are really the key components of that. And I'm gonna kind of take you through the work um, that as Scott said. You know, we've been doing as a district, really led by our nurses who are, are here, um, but also in consultation with the North Central Health District. Uh, before I get into that, though, I do want to touch on the other mitigation strategies uh, that we put in place, um, just to kind of you know recap some things. So if we look at the state and public health data uh, that's there, I know it's hard to see, so um, pull it up a little bit. The health, the health data. Uh, across the state, even though it's it's gone up over the past uh, few weeks here, uh, still ranks uh, within what the state, is, state DPH has determined, the low risk, uh, low community transmission category. Um, and it's fluctuated. I know I actually talked about it a few weeks ago at one of our workshops where it was trending up, um, and then it dipped back down within Holland County. Um, and so, you know, we've been fairly fortunate there um, as we've transitioned back to the full and person mode um, that that data has stayed low uh, throughout our time in school. The other thing that's important to note is 
The other layers of mitigation that I talked about, it's early, but they appear to be working, right? Uh, and so on calls with the Department of Public Health, uh, and you know, Patrice is, is hearing the same calls we are, and maybe can speak to it a little bit. Um, we're not seeing across the state widespread transition uh, transmission of COVID within the school setting. So I don't know if you want to say um, anything on your experience. Yes, that was very encouraging because when some of the communities in Connecticut started to see an increase, the State Department of Education and the Connecticut Department of Public Health caution them, they said, you know, these, these kind of general categories of if the case count, if the rolling average is whatever, um, you should consider this. The reason they didn't want to make it a hard and fast rule is because every situation is a little bit different. And what they were seeing in some of those communities where there was very high case count and increasing is that those cases couldn't necessarily be tied to an at-school transmission. And I mean, not enough time has passed and there's not enough numbers to really do some hard study data about it. But what they're seeing is, and you know, it's partly, I think, you know, and thanks to the adults, but I think it's a lot of the part is kids are a lot more resilient than maybe we expected them to be. And so they can get used to changes, most of them pretty quickly, but the mitigation is actually working. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no in-school transmission of cases, but generally with the data we have and the contact tracing we're doing, we're finding that, that there's not a lot of case transmission in school. We expect there to be some. It would be unreasonable to expect otherwise, but we're seeing a lot of case transmission out of schools. So for many communities in um, all eight of health districts towns have, you know, are a little bit different in their profile, but for, for kids, school is probably the safest place for them to be and if they're going to be maybe put with grandma or grandpa for the day every day, if there's no um, in-person school, then that's gonna trigger potentially some other risks. Or if they're gonna be wandering around in groups, going to parks, congregating, going to McDonald's, going to Dunkin' Donuts, then, you know, so closing schools seems to be a, the thing that people think of, um, oddly not closing sports, which is responsible for a significant illness transmission around um, amongst our young people in the community. But um, closing schools should be done thoughtfully, not reactively, not politically, not because people are stressed and freaking out, but if they're stressed and freaking out, we should bring them the information, they, all of the information they need to, so that the community can make the best decision. Um, yeah, and so you know that certainly jives with um, the small amount of evidence that we have. Uh, I'll talk about our you know kind of total numbers of, of cases and uh, things like that in a minute. But you know what Patricia said, um, you know we have seen as as well. Um, so uh, with that, just quick recognition. So I, I did want to recognize Patricia. I think Scott beat me to some of this at the beginning here, um, and I, I did want to also recognize the nurses. This has been. You know, they, they signed up to be a school nurse. They didn't sign up to be a, a public health nurse um, dealing with this all the time. And, and we spent an inordinate amount of time um, going through this. So we have Stephanie and Andrea, Kelly, uh, Lynn, Christy, and Danielle all with us here tonight. So I just want to publicly thank them for all of their hard work. Um, and they're also certainly here to answer questions as well um, as you may uh, have them through the presentation. All right, so preparing for somebody, if somebody gets sick, kind of broke this down into kind of four elements here. Uh, case identification, contact tracing, the risk assessment, and then isolation and quarantine. I'll go through each one. So case identification, right? This is really where we spend a lot of time and a lot of time with the nurses. Um, they're the ones on the front lines talking to families about what's going on with their kids, talking to staff about what's going on uh, if they put in a sick day and don't give us the, the reason why. Um, we're tracking all of those things. And I, I added it up today. We're close to 200 potential cases, right? So not actual cases, potential cases where people have gone and gotten tested um, that we've tracked throughout the beginning of the year. And that takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, we know that 
positivity rates in Connecticut are hot going up, but they're still, you know, 97% of people are testing negative. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, consistent with the data that we've seen, but it takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of parents, uh, you know, get on the phone with them and say, why does my kid uh, who has the sniffles need to stay home and get a test? And they're the ones who are, you know, holding the line and telling them that we treat all symptoms seriously. Um, we have daily meetings between the nurses, myself, and other administrators um, to know that we're all on the same page um, and talk about any cases or potential cases that do come up. Um, and we're also in constant contact with Patrice over here um, daily if needed and weekly uh, standings um, to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page, um, including Saturday mornings, sometimes, like it was uh, this past week. Or Sunday nights. Yes. Um, so in terms of the case identification, what are we looking for, right? So you have the full list of symptoms from the CDC there. Um, highlighted in blue, the ones that the State Department of Public Health um, has called out in their guidance as the, the highest risk. Um, but as I kind of said before, we take all symptoms seriously. There is no such thing in the era of COVID as it's just a cold. Um, and, you know, that's an adjustment for people. Um, you know, it, it unfortunately means that kids have to stay out or staff have to stay out of the building um, longer while they're potentially waiting for a test. Um, but we can't risk, you know, having a, a transmission moment within the schools because we're not being uh, vigilant. And some of the cases that we've seen have either been asymptomatic or very light symptoms, mild cases, um, where it has just been, our, our, you know, congestion. Um, as the first symptom that shows up. And so, you know, we are taking that seriously. And, you know, as I said, that's an adjustment for parents. Sometimes they hear it from the parents um, and, you know, they kind of hold that line for us that the nurses do. Um, so what do we define as a case? What are the diagnostic tests? Um, so I just wanted to um, kind of go through the kind of three different tests that are out there uh, that you might hear about. Um, so there's the RT-PCR, uh, which is the gold standard. Um, it's also called a molecular test. Um, it's a nasal swab uh, or oral that takes um, you know, typically two days, but we're seeing as many as four to six, um, depending on where you go to get a test. Um, and that's the one that we will accept for all diagnoses. Um, rapid tests, um, you know, we certainly have talked to people who've gone and got rapid tests or so we'll get both the rapid and the PCR, um, but we can't accept the rapid result um, as a, a negative anyway um, to come back into school. We need that uh, PCR test. Um, if, now, if there's a positive uh, for the rapid test, we're going to treat that as a positive and, and act on that, and there's been cases where we've done that. Um, don't hear about it as much uh, these days, but there's an antibody test or a serological test, um, which is really just, uh, it's not di it's not for diagnostic, it's really to see if you've ever had uh, COVID in the past. Um, it's testing for the antibodies that are left behind after you've caught the infection. Uh, but we don't uh, obviously accept those as a diagnosis. All right, and then, you know, when that positive test comes up, and, and we've had a few, um, you know, contact tracing is, is really the first step. And what contact tracing is, we're trying to find all the close contacts, which I'll show you the definition of in a second. We're not trying to map the whole network of people that you've ever been in touch with all the way out to the sixth degree of separation with Kevin Bacon up there. Um, we're, we're really looking for that circle uh, of people around um, the, the case that have spent the most time there um, I call them, you know, it's close contacts, first level, first degree of separation, um, so that we can figure out uh, who needs to be a quarantine and isolated. Right? And what we do as we're doing this contact tracing is we have to look at an infectious period. Uh, and the infectious period begins either two days prior to symptom onset, or in the case of uh, asymptomatic people, uh, two days prior to the test uh, being taken. Um, and so that plays out differently in different cases, right? When we send out these communications to the community and we say, we look at all the factors of uh, the, the case, um, we mean that because there are different times and in, in infectious periods based on when those symptoms come up. 
uh, and when those uh, symptoms uh, or test is, is developed. So, um, you know, here where you have a case of, um, you know, the symptom onset on Friday, you know, we would be looking at three days potentially within a school, um, even though we're only notified about it uh, on Monday. Um, and so we have to go back and do those that tracing for those last three days uh, that they were in school. By investing in the case identification and making sure that we keep kids out of school, we, we reduce the number of days that we have to contact trace for. And, and that's one of the big elements of that first um, step. Um, but there's also sometimes where, you know, we may be notified on Tuesday, um, maybe the case uh, onset symptom development was on a Monday, um, and then and the kid was out of school. So you're looking at Monday where the kid was out of school, Saturday and Sunday where they were at home, and there's no potential exposure within the school setting um, that we necessarily have to do contact tracing for. Now we will talk to the family and, and make sure that they're not hanging out with anybody outside of school or that there's nobody else um, on a sports team that they may have um, you know, seen over the weekend. Um, and so we do, do have to do some contact tracing, but it's not to the same element um, where we're talking about an in, possible in-school uh, exposure. All right, and I've used that term close contact. So what is it? Primarily what we're looking for um, is within six feet of one another for a cumulative 15 or more minutes. Um, so not, you know, just uh, cumulative, not just like, you know, I'm, I'm here for five minutes and then walk away and then come back for uh, another 10. Like that's cumulative. Um, so throughout the day, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be at all, all at once. Um, you know, and then direct physical contact, sharing, you know, food utensils. Hopefully people are taking a little bit better care to, to not do some of these things, you know, with some elbow bumps um, here, you know, to kind of prevent that direct physical contact. Um, but those are other things that we're looking for when we talk about uh, post contacts. And then other factors we look for, you know, one, do we have enough information um, to make decisions? What classes were they in? What medication strategies were in place? Uh, were they symptomatic in school? Um, and did they spend any time with anybody outside? And we do all those things so we can kind of do our risk assessment. I'm gonna kind of do uh, a little analogy here, right? So if you think uh, about a shark in the water, that's a hazard, right? But it's really only hazard to the people who are swimming. Um, you have to be swimming for it to be a hazard to you. And we also know that other things like seals in the water close to you when you're swimming um, make the sharks more dangerous, right? And so kind of the analogy here is we know that there's a hazard in coronavirus, but we have to define who's in the water, right? And that's what that contact tracing process does. Um, it defines who was within contact where there could potentially be that transmission. And then we also have to look at the other factors, right? Was the case symptomatic? Were they coughing all over the place? Were people wearing masks? Were they congregating in large groups? Were they playing sports, as Patrice mentioned? All these things potentially make the transmission more likely. Um, and so we have to take those into uh, account as well. And so that's where we do our risk assessment process. We put those through uh, with the guidance from the health professionals from the state. Um, they've issued really um, the, the, the key ones for here are addendum five and addendum nine, um, you know, which talk about contact tracing in schools, talks about who needs to be isolated and quarantined. And when we do all that get information gathering, um, these are the matrices that we're, we're putting them through and all that information through. So what does it mean to isolate? If you develop positive symptoms, you have to isolate yourself for a 10 day period. Um, that's defined by the CDC. Um, it's because they know that the amount of time that you're shedding the virus is between typically like five and eight days. They tack on a couple extra days on top of it to make sure, uh, and then you might close yourself at home. To quarantine is when you're a close contact, right? So it's not that you've developed any symptoms, it's not that you have COVID, it's just that you were in close proximity at six feet or less for 15 minutes. Um, to somebody who has COVID, lab diagnosed COVID. Um, and that's when you quarantine for 14 days. I think one of the things, and the nurses know this because the parents uh, ask it all the time, is 
why is it 10 days for somebody who is positive and 14 days for somebody who is just a close contact? That's because you know the variable, right? So you know the variable that the person is sick, you know the infectious period, and so you can do that 10 days. The 14-day period is because you can develop COVID symptoms from being a close contact. Typically, it's five to seven days, but it's up to you know 10 or 12, and so they conservatively put it at, at 14 days that you have to stay in quarantine. Um, and so that's why there's that difference there. It's not always... Um, fair, you know, we certainly had issues where um, a sibling test positive um, for the case uh, for COVID, and you actually have to do, if you can't isolate that sibling from the rest of the family, you have to run out the 10 days of the sibling's isolation, the case's isolation, and then tack on 14 days uh, on top of it, which is a long time for people to be out of school, but we have had those situations pop up, um, which is unfortunate for the kids. But you know, in order to protect us, that's the health guidance that we need to uh, to follow. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, now cases within the district, and we have had a few. Um, we've communicated out on them. We've had really four um, possible cases of school uh, exposure within the schools: two staff and two students. Um, though the students were actually a linked uh, transmission event. Um, and we've also had some cases outside of school. So we've had three cases where there's really been no potential school exposure um, and plenty of family members, whether it's uh, a father or a mother or um, you know, a sibling that returns from college um, that have tested positive that have caused our students to have to quarantine. Um, we have seen plenty of those at, as well. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about how we do it. So we, as I said, we go through that whole risk assessment contact tracing process to identify who are the close contacts. And you can see it varies uh, from case to case. Um, you know, in our first case in September, um, you know, just by the nature of the position of the staff member, um, we only had to isolate uh, two staff and, and four students. Um, but if you look at, you know, the third case on October 8th, uh, you're talking one student uh, there was out that impacted 42 others because of the, again, all the fact that factors and conditions that are associated with that. So it's, it's really a case by case analysis that we do to track down the close contacts, um, doing all those things that I talked about earlier and, you know, quarantine people uh, as needed. Um, but overall numbers to date, you know, we're talking about a uh, hundred and I think it was up to 120 today. Um, that had to quarantine in total um, at some point in time throughout the, the school year here. Um, you know, we've had seven, as I said, cases uh, that have been lab confirmed. And, um, you know, we've had 3,100 other students participating um, and staff members participating in school as needed. Um, so, you know, it's really still been a small sliver of people overall impacted. Um, you know, the other thing is we're continuing to be open and transparent of, about all of everything that's going on. We're, we're making changes to that as well. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I don't see the Hill there, but I do see Sue. I know Sue's had to send out um, communications to classes um, where, you know, a student may just be dismissed for the day um, and they may go home through the isolation room that, that we've set up. Um, and, you know, just out of a precautionary basis, we're moving that class, we're cleaning the room, um, but we do communicate with that class that, uh, you know, hey, just FYI, parents and guardians, uh, a kid was dismissed from that class today. Um, they're sent for a follow-up and we'll let you know the results. Um, and then, you know, when we get the results in, which have been negative, um, we send that result back to the class today. Just FYI, the test came back negative and all is good. Um, so we're trying to be open and transparent about what's going on within the schools, even when there's not a, a defined case. Um, but you know that something that the kids could go home and say, "Hey, by the way, you know Johnny went home sick today and we moved the class." Um, so we've tried to be proactive about the communication there. Um, certainly, um, you know when there's been a close contact um, within the school, um, it's fallen to the principals and front office staff to communicate um, with those close contacts. Um, we put in both a phone call and an email to them 
um, so that they know what the kind of parameters of the quarantine are. Uh, I know John's had to make some of those uh, calls, Mike had maybe too, um, you know, had to make some of those calls, um, you know, to, to let parents know. Um, and then, you know, the, the emails that come from Scott to the community, um, every time we've had a potential uh, exposure within school, we're sending out that email um, so that people know what's going on. Um, we've also posted, and these have been up for a while, um, some FAQs on the website about all this. Um, you know, just what is close contact? How are, how are we treating things? Uh, those have been there. Um, and we just recently put up and kind of rebranded our um, reopening COVID page um, to include a dashboard that we're going to update weekly of uh, how many kids are out on isolation or, or staff are out on isolation um, and how many staff or students are quarantined. Um, at any given time. And so the, we're being fully transparent to the public uh, about what's going on uh, within our schools. And, you know, the numbers do change. You know, right now we're looking at 45 kids who are currently in, uh, or staff and students who are currently in uh, quarantine. Um, that was 80 as of Monday, um, because, you know, a couple uh, of the case of the high school, um, those kids came back Monday and Tuesday. And so we kind of have those come back into the school transition back in. Um, so it does change, um, but we'll update it weekly so that everybody knows. And I think that's does it for me. I think the big things are for us, you know, in terms of lesson learned, um, you know, we'll continue to monitor as low, state and local health data, uh, monitor those trends within the schools, um, see if there's any improvements that we can make on mitigation efforts uh, there. Um, obviously, continue that open and transparent communication. And then, you know, I, the big thing is just community education. So, you know, presentations like this, um, talking with st staff, talking with uh, families as they, they contact and setting out that information is what we need to do to make sure that everybody stays vigilant. Um, you know, we're not yet the, the cold and flu season. I mean, that's going to be a, a, a strain on the district, I, I think. Um, and so, we're going to have to make sure that the community. Uh, knows about it and is prepared for it. And if you saw, I guess you walked in, you saw a flu shot sign. Um, we actually had clinics uh, the last two weeks, uh, but also next week um, for our staff to get flu shots. Uh, so we can hopefully mitigate um, you know, some of that flu season crossing over with uh, COVID. So that, if I may, yeah. um, first and foremost, I think that was an outstanding presentation. Um, I think you have a future in public health, Trace, if there's any openings in <laughs> for I mean, that was excellent. <laughs> very, 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 very well done, though. And, and, I, and I think what I should have said in the beginning of this presentation, which again was excellent, Brian, um, you know, why is this on the agenda? And Scott and I had a conversation about this, and uh, we consulted with Patrice. Now, this is this is this could be very scary for people who don't understand the public health science behind it, uh, who are not living this every day like like we are, like some of us are, and and so when you hear there's a positive case, it creates a lot of buzz, and, and you hear about it in social media. You know, my phone rings. I'm sure board members around the table. I know they have been contacted by various constituencies with with justifiable concerns. You know, they they want to know what what's going to happen and. What does this mean? If there's a positive case, should we close down the whole school? And the answer is no. And we wanted to share that information, what happens behind the scenes, the hard work that the administration, the staff, our school nurses who are on the front lines of this pandemic, you know, you're, you're heroes. So thank you for doing what you do. Um, but there's so much that happens, so many moving parts that go into an informed decision-making process. And I'm really proud in Ellington, we, we rely on the science, we rely on our experts to make our decisions. And there might be a day when we close the school, but it's not today. And we've looked at every case individually, we've assessed it, we've analyzed it, we've, we've put it against the best public health science available. And, and so far, I think we've been able to have a very measured um, and strategic approach to dealing with it. And you laid it out, you know, I mean, we're 100% transparent. And that's, that's part of why we did this presentation. And we'll do it again, Brian. I may ask Scott to do it again. Maybe we'll do it in a different form. Um, but, but whatever it takes to keep the community educated so that they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it is in the best interest of, of staff and students, I think that's critically important. I have a couple other comments, and then I, I would love to open it up to the board for, for more questions. Patrice was way too quiet today, <laughs> so I, I'm going to uh, give you the accolades you deserve. 
For those of you who don't know Patrice, I've known her for a while and I work with her. I have the pleasure of working with her in my day job. Um, she's on 24-7, 365. I will say on the record publicly, you are the best local health director in the state of Connecticut. And we're very fortunate to have you in our school system. So thank you for everything you do. You're very humble. I talked about servant leadership. You're another perfect example of that as well. Very hands-on. Um, always there for us in Ellington when we need you, providing guidance and advice, and uh, we thank you for that very, very much. So um, with that, if, if there's questions from board members specific to the presentation, that would be the time to um, ask them. And then if, if there's anything that the school nurses would like to add, um, I, I do, I'll throw out one question and we'll let the board members ask questions first, but, but think about this. Um, if there's anything you need from the board, let us know tonight. You know, if there's something, there's a piece of equipment that you need, if there's more support you need in certain areas, you know, whatever that might be, medically, you know, you're here tonight, you took the time out of your schedule. And when I call you a hero, that I don't say that lightly. So if we can support you in the work that you're doing to keep our district and our children safe, by all means, think about it. And when you come up and speak, if there's something you want to ask of us, by all means, do so. So questions from board members, comments? Ryan, can I ask you what happens with um, the buses? I mean, are you tracing on the buses also? Do the kids have assigned seats? Yes, uh, they do have assigned seats. Uh, first student has work to do that. They do have their uh, bus rides there. And I, uh, they do send them to us when we're doing that contact tracing process. Um, you know, again, you have to have the right information. Um, so I know we were going through one contact tracing process and the bus driver told the bus yard that they don't really follow the, um, you know, follow the key. So we said, well, why not? Now, luckily in that particular case, um, the student wasn't riding the bus. Um, but, you know, if it, that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have had the information necessary to limit the number of kids on the bus um, that we could would have had to quarantine and that number would go up even further from where it was. Um, and so we've kind of instituted that with the first unit, like make sure that the kids are following that. Um, we do have them for a purpose. Um, and if they're not, you know, like all of our mitigation strategies, if they're not done with fidelity, uh, it, it's not gonna work. Anything else, Liz? Yeah, do you, um, I guess this is for Patrice, um, do you work with the Hartford Health System and other districts because kids are moving around too as far as um, when you identify children, do you do they deal with it or do you continue to deal with it? We're in, um, we're in very constant close contact with all of our colleagues, whether it's a school exposure, a sports exposure, um, we're talking to each other. We're talking to lots of our colleagues over the line in Massachusetts because there's teams and sporting events that are doing here. And so I'm sure we'll all be great friends by the time it's over. But um, I have I have uh, the Hartford Health Director on speed dial. So. And, and this is where you know I mentioned that kind of family uh, and staff connections with the school uh, come in play, and, and really the nurses doing this. You know, oftentimes Patrice will call me and say, "Hey, I got a case for you," and I'll be like. Yeah, I know my nurse told me about it 20 minutes ago. Um, and so it's, it's really the work that they're doing to connect with the families and understand what's going on within the families um, that helps us to kind of uh, get ahead of the curve on some of these things as well, regardless of where uh, a student's coming from. Thank you. Chris? Um, I'm curious as to um, about the asymptomatic cases. I know you said that it's from the day of the test. You're going back two days from there. But how confident are you with that, that they weren't maybe symptomatic and that it should there be like a buffer day in there somewhere or we're just... I, I only play a public health expert on TV. Um, <laughs> so so I listen to like Patrice and the CDC, but I know that's what the CDC guidelines are. So yes, and, and that's actually a really good question. And I, so I think at the beginning of the school year, everybody's gotten so used to it and these nurses are fantastic. But um, we got used to it from kind of following up on things before school was back in session. So if you start with this template, we're maybe capturing, I'm gonna make up a number, 42% of the exposures. It is very far from perfect. And so you're absolutely correct. When you get a test day for an asymptomatic individual and you're gonna say you're gonna look two days back, because what, what are you going to do? Look. They could, they could remain testing positive 
for up, you know up to months and not even be infectious anymore. And so the you know kind of you have to make just like there's a case definition for any sort of communicable illness. There's a like a limitation where we're going to choose this. It, but you're right. It's certainly not perfect, and nobody should think that it is perfect. And I kind of compare it to Lyme disease and ticks. I say, I tell people all the time, they bring in ticks. I say, it's the tick that you don't know is on you and falls off without you seeing it that's more likely to make you sick. And so there's sometimes they're so kind of hyper-focused on contacts that aren't close contacts and parents and other concerned individuals. And we certainly understand why they're concerned. And we, I say, listen, if you're out and about, you know, are you going to the hairdresser? Are you going out to eat? Are you going shopping? Um, you are getting exposed. You're, that nobody can ensure or assure you that you're not getting exposed. So we have this kind of template of things we can do, um, but there, we're knowing that that's maybe this much space and there's this much space over here that there's things we can't do. But also, we can be fairly confident with the testing data we're getting around us. So, you know, our level of concern, if there's maybe five cases in a town, is going to be very different than if there's 500 cases in a town, as far as, you know, our level of concern. We try to be as conservative as we can, um, and balancing that with the impact on the workplace and students needed to get their education. But but you're hitting on a perfect point. They could have been already positive for 10 days or 10 weeks. Thank you. Mary? Well, um, first of all, I want to thank Scott and Brian for getting the um, link with the town up so quickly. I, I'm getting positive results of reports on that. Good. So thank you. I brought that up last week and it's working and I want to publicly thank you for that. Um, but my question is for Patrice. Could you explain why we're using Holland County data um, to determine our numbers when people are, are saying to me, I'm concerned that I'm getting little text that said we had eight people today, five people yesterday. And why are we using Tom County numbers and not Ellington numbers? So could you explain that to me? Because I can't answer that question. Yes, I can. And that's another good question. So at the beginning when um, this we were, you know, after the state for months to develop guidelines to give us context on how we could make certain decisions and advise our schools um, at the state level the state epidemiologist said you cannot look at really small numbers and draw statistical inferences from those numbers the numbers are just too small and Ellington has a very small population and so the state told us tell your towns we're not going to look you they can't just look at the town data um, Ellington and other of our towns that are small, you could have a little bit of what looks like, I hate to even use the word spike because it's not really a spike. Um, you could have a blip or an increase of cases and it could look like a high percentage, but the lower your denominator is, so the lower your population number is, the less meaningful that numerator becomes. And um, I, then after the state told us that, two days later, they put out town statistics. Can you tell us they're going to do that? So it's kind of like a fun game of hide and seek in my world. Um, but it continues to happen, and we continue to try to draw people back um, to the big picture in order to make decisions. And so it's important to keep looking at the numbers, but to be really, really cautious about, um, about the conclusions we're going to draw on, on percentages or rolling averages. And um, if, in case people don't realize, I think the state just, maybe it was last week, it's all a blur, they went from a seven-day rolling average to a 14-day rolling average. If you're watching the cases and you're getting case data daily, as I am, you'll see that if there's a situation here, you don't really start to see the results of that for about two weeks. And what you should also take into consideration that 
um, testing has increased so much across the state and people are getting tested for so many reasons. When you look for more cases, you're going to find asymptomatic cases because you're looking for them. And it doesn't mean that the situation is actually changing. It just means kind of you're discovering more, a little bit more of the true picture. Does that help at all? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Call me tomorrow if you want. You can talk about it. Miriam will, Patrice. <laughs> Other questions, comments from board members, please? Anything that the school nurses would like to add, I'd love to hear from you. Any comments, suggestions, ideas, thoughts for the board? Anything we can do for you? Another set of arms would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Supplies. Yeah. I'm from mine. I come on up. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I don't know if the camera goes that far. <laughs> well, just speak loud so we can all hear you. Then. Gloves. Gloves, okay. I've had three different orders completely back ordered. They told me there's 70,000 boxes ahead of me. Um, yeah. So that's one thing that we could use. I had a couple um, when I started school. But at the end of last year in March, when we went out, they came into our offices and because they needed them in the hospitals and whatnot, they cleaned out all of our supply, and I've never been able to get that supply back. Okay, good. Well, that's that's. I don't know. Week, I've tried back this week. Yeah. I'm actually going to one of the companies that are so needy because they have the type of glove. The thing is, you can get like gloves that would be um, used in a kitchen or whatever, but not medical grade. Medical grade, okay. they're very hard to come by. Okay. Is that true for all of you? I mean, are you running out of gloves? All We're of very low well stock. I, I would say I know I'm very low. Well. Because not out, but for I that same reason, we're just low stock. We don't have as much as we thought we would. The bad ones. Usually, okay. we don't find out until the rest of our order has arrived. Right. Like, it'll be in stock when you place the order, but then when the rest of the order comes, they'll say, "Oh, here, you take your gloves or mask." Yeah. Right. 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 Good. Now that's good for us to know because I think through Scott, myself, Patrice, that's actually really good for us to know because we, we, we could look at other avenues either through state homeland security, public health, and even there those supplies are low, but you know, you start piecing it together, it could become you know viable quantities for you. Better to have you know some than none. So yeah. anything else we anything else that you'd like to share with us, your experiences so far? I just think um, what Steph also said, extra help, because I know we're short with subs alone, so it's kind of stressful for us, especially, like, I can only speak for myself, I have two little kids, so if something happens to them, you know, like, we don't have any subs to, like, if we had a call out, things like that, so that's a little stressful. Okay. Um, so it's very stressful. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, like, you know, just alone, like, the contact tracing is, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And I could, once again, I'm only speaking for myself, I'm a high school nurse. So one nurse for 800 and something students, plus sports afterward, it's a lot for, I mean, I'll do it, the principals do it, but that's a lot to be doing for just one nurse in the school, I feel like. And I know like it's a lot for them too. So, I mean, I can only speak for myself on that part. So do you think you need help with tracing? Would that alleviate some of the stress if you had help with tracing? Um, well, I think that that's time. hard because you it's confidentiality. It's our students who are calling families that we have, you know, um, a relationship with. They're going to tell you things that I don't think they're just going to. It's not like you can get an office person to really ask them the things that need to be asked for the contact. So I think it would have to be in some way a medical person mm -hmm. um, or maybe someone to cover her office while she does that contact mm -hmm. because families, um, it's a stressful time mm -hmm. if you're talking about it. Even telling them they have to get a test sometimes can be overwhelming to them and they um, they get angry with us. That, you know, I mean, we're doing our job, but they, um, it can get stressful at times. And I feel like we have a better rapport with 
our families. So I think it would have to be maybe something to cover an office for the visits of the people coming in versus, that's my opinion. I, my families, I yeah, feel like no, I know, I you know, know, give me more the correct information because sometimes they don't want to share everything that's uh, happening. Some of the cases, um, the one thing that they were talking about was um, the cases where you don't know they're asymptomatic. Some of those, what I'm seeing is that those are being picked up on people who were going in for surgery mm -hmm. and they're required to get a test and then quarantine prior to the surgery. And that's where they're starting to pick up in the ones that I'm seeing yeah. um, where they're finding them to be asymptomatic. People are they're like, oh my gosh, like I had no clue. I was going in this week for surgery and then you've got to see, okay, if it's a grandparent, you know, okay, they had a family dinner or whatever. So um, we have to trace that as well. So just a and thought on that. Just the, the stress alone of the contact tracing, but um, on top of that, you know, like Chrissy had mentioned, um, you know, I didn't see them, but I also have four little kids. So um, I think the stress of, you know, if they get sick, what are we going to do? Um, and, um, you know, maybe if we did have, you know, another set of hands, um, you know, with another nurse that could, you know, with a little part-time thing could come in and, and help, whether they cover the office or they help with the contact tracing or, you know, God forbid, you know, Danielle said or tell us anybody's sick, you know, we have them on board already at the school and say, okay, you know, I got to send them home or they're sick today, you can go cover that school. Um, you know, lucky, luckily not that when we were two of us, so if somebody needs them to flip to another school, but once it, you know, like Brian said, once cold and flu season comes, it's a little bit more, you know, it's going to be a little bit more of a stressful time. So, thank you. On top of our new computer system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, well, no, I mean, we don't have a yeah. that knows our new computer yeah. system. So to come in and absolutely do care, the only way that you can do a medical record is if they need to be um, pulled in and yeah. how to do it. We're still being learning. It's yeah. a big change. It started, you know, when we came back to school and you pulled it in and everything all at once. So that's been a challenge. Now, you start contracting, uh, tracing right away. Yeah. And generally, how long will it take you to complete that to know who's going? Oh, it goes on days. We're getting called on the weekend because that's when the results, yeah. like we're yeah. on like 24 7. People are emailing us or texting us all the time because we need to know. As we ask them, please let me know as soon as you know the result. Because if it's positive, we've got to call Brian where you know to make sure that anybody that was in contact is going to know we're not having people come back into school on a monday um that can't be there so it's pretty fluid yeah it's that case identification part that really takes up a lot of those time um and the contact tracing part you know the nurses are they get ahead we get a head start on it if we can you know if, if we think it's you know we're, we're getting a sense i think now of which cases are more likely to be positive and which ones aren't um you know it's not down to a science but you know we i think we have some some gut feel so um we may start contact tracing process whether by just grabbing a list of students um that they were you know in class with um just to kind of get that initial list and then once that case comes back whether it's on a tuesday night or a you know saturday morning um we have that kind of initial work done um, then it really falls to kind of a combination of the nurses, the principals, um, the you know to some extent the, the front office staff as well um, to finish that uh, contact tracing process um, so that we can identify those people that we need to quarantine. I, I just want to make a one point. I think we we had one situation where the timing was it, it's all about the timing with some of these right. So we knew we were going to be getting a possible positive case and we knew the timing wasn't good and we were sitting here going well i don't think we're going to be able to figure out how to do the contact tracing to the level we can do it um, at the high school in time to kind of like open the school right and so we went with a different strategy instead of just saying okay if that comes back we're just going to close the school for the day and do distance learning we basically cast a wide net a very wide net we said 
let's just assume we can't do the contact tracing. What is the maximum exposure of this of this particular situation? And it ended up being the number was like 165. And we're like, okay, so if it comes back positive, we have no time to contact trace. We're gonna we're gonna contact all 165 of those individuals, and we're gonna tell them you are silver group for this day. For one day, don't come in. We're still opening Ellington High School, which means still you're still going to get you know a good 650 kids still coming to school right and then that day we do the contact tracing and that 165 number could go down to like 42 or 35 or something like that and then we say to those kids you're quarantined the other 130 of you you can come back right so that was one strategy where we know there's a there's a significant benefit to the community that we serve to keep the schools open if we can do that in a safe and measured way. And so that was one strategy we had, but we didn't have to use it, fortunately. And if, if I could just acknowledge, thank you for being um, transparent, candor with your concerns. We heard you and we will work with the administration to address them promptly. Right. Thank, and thank you. you for the work thank that you, you do very, thank very much. We appreciate it. If I may, I know we have to move on to the agenda. You mentioned flu shots. Yes. Are, are we doing a clinic for staff? Do we normally do that in house? So we we, no, we normally do it every year. Um, and participation, I think, is between you know seventy and eighty or so in a given year. Um, we expanded that this year, uh, and I believe we're probably approaching one hundred and fifty to one hundred and sixty um, staff members that are going to end up getting a, a who, flu who, shot. Who administers the vaccine? Uh, this year we went with. I think it was affiliated physicians or affiliated nurses. Right. We, I know we, if you're looking at the burner nurses, um, we've used them in the past, but for some reason it didn't work time wise for us. Okay, that's great. Well, Patrice has a program as well. I don't know yep. how, straight, how straight out her program is, but uh, that's always an option as well. So you can certainly take a look at that if that's something you want us to look at as well as Patrice. But again, thank you, Patrice. Is there anything else you want to add before we move on? Um, no, I just want to say that um, it's been just a pleasure. You know, we're getting like people are hitting the wall in local public health departments, like a lot of people, and working with all of our school partners across our district has been just so encouraging. We're really getting to know each other well. But you know, when you can have a laugh about it or say, you know, you're talking on Saturday morning, on Saturday night, on Sunday afternoon. Um, you do get this sense that you're all in it together. And I think, you know, to me, um, it's very satisfying. And I know a lot of times the end user of that, the kind of services we're providing now, isn't fully aware of all that's done 24 seven behind the scenes to kind of keep them as safe as they can. For me, that's not so critical. Like, like I know we're doing it. And I just really value the partnerships very much. Two-way street. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you.